Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, just like to give you a warm welcome to our Furniture Makers uh, webinar, start of a new series for us, the second series. And uh, this one will be looking at post-pandemic strategies to build back better. So uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Peter Holland. I'm the founder of uh, Linear Structure Sales Management. And it's my pleasure to be your, your chair for this morning. And uh, what are we going to focus on today? Well, really, in this first webinar, we're going to look at exploring some of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic, but then also looking at how these focus in on the, the uh, influences of production and purchasing made in the area of sustainability. So uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, a panel of experts with me from the industry. Let me introduce you to them all this morning. So um, on my screen, middle right, I have uh, Richard Esri, Director of Sustainability and Innovation at Harrison Spinks. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, all. Um, I also have uh, Joanna Knight, uh, Sustainability and Circular Economy Manager at Women in Office Design. Good morning, Joe. Hi there. And uh, Daniel Hopwood, founder of the studio Hopwood. Good morning, Daniel. Pleasure to have you with us. Past president of the BIID and present chair of the Bespoke Guildmark at Delivery, I hasten to add. Hello. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And finally, Kate, good morning to you. Uh, Kate Wright is the Group Head of Sustainability Product Development at the DFS Group. So welcome to all of you this morning. Thanks for, for taking the time to, to join us. Looking forward to this conversation that we have. Uh, all of you are valued members of Delivery in, in various ways uh, and are participating. So it's lovely to have you with us. Now, for any of you that aren't sort of familiar with the Furniture Makers Company, uh, we are the Furnishing Industries Charity. So what does that mean? Well, we support education, we support training and celebrate excellence in design, and we also look after uh, welfare of people in need, uh, either who have worked in the industry or currently working in the industry. So just to give you an idea of the work that the livery does, um, currently, the current campaign, which is Step to It, I'm really pleased to, to say that this program is being championed by the master, David Woodward, and so far they have achieved £120,000. So I uh, urge you to get involved in any way you can to, uh, to support, support this work. All right, so today's format is very much an open discussion uh, on, on the topics, and we wanted to look at maybe some approaches, some innovative thinking and ideas coming out of this sort of uh, period of, of pandemic and what we can do moving forward. So no doubt you may have your own questions. Um, so what we'd invite you to do is to maybe put them in the Q&A. Uh, for the webinar, and we'll be happy to ask our panellists if they can come back and uh, just respond to those post-event. We'll also be uh, producing a recording and a post-event summary of the event. Okay, that's the intro done. So now we can get on to the fun stuff. So let's talk <laughs> about, let's start talking about these subjects then. So the first one that we wanted to look at was embracing carbon reduction initiatives. And, and the question that's really linked to this is, do customers understand what is green? So do they know what is genuinely green? Um, or should eco-credentials, should they be clearer? Could, they, could we help them to make a more informed buying decision? Uh, do you want me to kick off with that one? Yeah, go for it. So, so for, and I'm only talking about... Um, my industry, the mattress industry, um, for me, this is about standards more than anything. Mm -hmm. So I guess in general, there is a vague understanding of what a green product is or a green company. But when it comes to the detail of what's carbon neutral, what's, uh, what's net zero, there probably isn't so much of an understanding. But in terms of th this, for me, is about a standard for a product or, or a company even, because obviously a company could be carbon neutral but their products could be actually quite polluting mm. so as far as i'm aware in terms of a mattress there isn't really a green standard so to really communicate that to customers um, perhaps as an industry one of the things we need to be looking at is to actually have a green standard for for a product obviously company credentials need to be taken into account for that to be meaningful because some products could be slightly polluting, wouldn't necessarily capture sort of carbon, but mm -hmm. the company as a whole 
could be doing the right thing, capturing a lot of carbon and be, be you know, net zero, for instance. So for me, this is really about a standard and a way of displaying that that product, that company is actually doing the right thing and has some very good green credentials and maybe has a scoring mechanism, a bit like um, an energy rating, perhaps for white goods, yeah. something like that. So, so, so that's the way I would answer it. And clearly, there's for, for, for my industry, there's a lot of work to be done with that. I know certainly the MBF are, are actually looking at undertaking this sort of um, project, I think. Yeah, so, I think so there is some, some work going on for that. Can I just, can I just add that? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I really do work on a very much an individual basis with an end user. Um, I sell your mattresses, for example. Right. Um, quite a lot, actually. They're marvellous. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's high-end, net, you know, high-net-worth individuals and doing their houses. There's one word I would not use, is the, or, or two words, I wouldn't use the word eco or sustainability because they think they're going to get an egg box for a sofa. Um, it's, it's untrendy <laughs> and people are frightened of it. And why should they have to know about sustainability in the furnishing industry anyway is our specialist subject. Now, by default, they are sustainable. They are eco-friendly because the requests that they make are, we want good design that's going to last mm. um, and it's, it, it, it's well made. And those issues, I think, are what actually is the core value of sustainability is buy once, buy, buy the best and buy once. Um, so I think in so many ways, the sustainability story has got a little bit preachy and um, um, a little bit of fear mongering amongst people when actually all we've got to do is just step back to this sort of 20, 30 years ago when the core values was built to last. Well, I'd like to jump in here, Daniel, because I'd have to disagree. Um, because. <laughs> <laughs> it took so long it took so long <laughs> <laughs> mainly because i'm looking at this from a completely different marketplace in terms of the commercial and office workplace sector where there is a tendency for fast fashion um designs last or are held in place probably three to five years and then everything's chucked away and start again so the the expertise and um, skills in terms of longevity and durability, which manufacturers are starting to invest in, are only enacted, if you like, by the occupiers and the people undertaking the refits. And so, mm -hmm. therefore, there does need to be more understanding of what's green. And in the this field, there are lots of standards, and in many ways, that's what's confusing. There are so many standards, and more importantly they're really expensive to achieve. And so therefore potentially excludes some very sustainable products. But, but, so there you go. So sorry, Dan. <laughs> no, no, I'm in agreement. I think it's, it's in the commercial world where there's massive amount of buying uh, by professional buyers and sellers, fair enough. I think in the, in the private world, um, it's a duty of an interior designer to understand about what sustainability is and sell it in, in, in the right manner um, so people don't think you know that they're going to get a home that's going to look overly sustainable but actually you can achieve this and still have a luxury home yeah Is, isn't the point about making an informed decision so as a consumer they need to make an informed decision and without something that gives them that clear understanding they cannot make an informed decision it's just the story that's not substantiated by anything that that's the issue if I was sitting presenting to a Saudi princess, which is what I do, um, and I tell her about how beautifully made your mattresses are and they're usable from the sheep from outside your factory, she'll love that. If I said yeah. this is eco-friendly and sustainable, she'd look at me quite blankly. Um, but I, it's my responsibility as a designer, as a professional, to ensure that what I am actually going to give to that client is sustainable and is a good thing. Agreed. I would uh, also echo your comments, Daniel. Um, from a retail point of view, the average consumer isn't concerned about the uh, eco-credentials of what they're buying, and they do expect the brand to have done the work for them. They're reassured to see some eco-credentials, particularly ones they recognise, such as FSC. 
um, but rather a brand will lose credibility with a customer and lose the um, their reputation if they haven't already put that work in. So mm. it's not a question of actually being able to value add in sales purchase. It's an expectation that it's already there. And it is our responsibility as brand to make sure that we've done everything we possibly can to make the product sustainable. What I struggle with is when customers are presented with a choice, they will perhaps choose something that isn't as sustainable as it could be because they're going to choose style or comfort or price point first. We do quite a lot of research into understanding just where sustainability sits on their priority list. And unfortunately, it's still a really long way down. So that puts the burden back on us to find the innovative solutions so that just becomes inherent in the product. But I'm sure you're all familiar. There are a lot of challenges with this industry, with the product that we make and making them more and more green. Um, But yes, I, I, I don't think customers really understand the impact they have, particularly at the end of the product life cycle. They don't seem to understand that when they go to dispose of a product, actually the combination of different materials has a huge environmental impact. Um, and I would agree that I think education is absolutely key. And as much as we possibly can, we need to try and seed um, some understanding into the different materials, the impacts that they have into the customer journey to try and help them learn about it a bit more, bring it up in their consciousness, but obviously do it in a very careful storytelling way so it doesn't come across as preachy, um, mm-hmm. to your point, Daniel. Yeah. <clears throat> Richard, I think you're absolutely right about standards. Because one of the issues at the moment is certainly in the commercial field, there's so much greenwashing um, and, exactly. semi, and semi-greenwashing. So there's an element of truth in there, but it's mixed in with a lot of hype. And if there were clearer standards and readily achievable standards, hmm. I mean, they still have to be robust, but not so expensive that they're out of the reach of many manufacturers, then I think that would be a positive way forward. But I also agree with Dan. I think designers and specifiers have a responsibility. Um, it's slightly different with end users, but have a responsibility to educate themselves and understand. I mean, I so often hear people saying, oh, well, if we buy from a company that's lo- local to my customer, that's got to be a good thing. And you think, really? Do you, have you not heard of supply chains? <laughs> and it, it just worries me that you have professional people making comments like that. We, we've got, um, actually, there's been something quite news come out. I mean, as an interior designer, I've tried to read up and, and understand about sustainability. Um, um, but because, you know, I'm not manufacturing the same thing over and over again, I have to be an expert in all are not knowledgeable of lots of diff- different things. It's quite hard to find the answer. Um, but the, the British Institute of Interior Design has decided to um, get on with it and start guiding us interior designers. And they've actually, they've just issued a paper as a guidance to help us along. So I think it's, you know, there's those small steps that can help along the way. Um, I've been reading that over the last few days. It's literally just come out and I'm finding it quite exciting so exciting that if you go onto my Instagram, you'll see it on a link on the bio. You can read it yourself and have a look at it if you're if you're an interior designer listening to this, because I think that's going to it's a really sensible outline of the, the steps that we can make as an interior as interior designers. Yeah. Thank you guys. So um my kind of takeaways from that is that you you do feel that there's an inherent responsibility for manufacturers to do some of this heavy lifting early on. But then education is key, isn't it? If I, as a, as a buyer, uh, I need to understand in, 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 in a simple format, if we could work out trying to uh, improve that education process, it's easier for me to make that decision and understand w- what it is that I'm buying and, and the implications longer term, not just short term. Now, the second one is quite interesting. It talks about this idea of eco-design. Will customers pay? Okay. So there's an increasing emphasis now on product design that will improve reuse with recycling potential, maybe durability to maximize uh, the useful life of the product, create available spares and components uh, that will use environmentally sensitive materials. So how should manufacturers manufacturers communicate a clear message of added value and customer benefits? 
I mean, not, on my side, again, you know, back to the end user, I, I, you know, we were chatting a bit earlier and I was saying that, um, you know, you, you, you buy well and you buy once. And, uh, you know, I've been, in the, uh, I've been a designer for 30 years now and I've got clients who've got furniture uh, that they bought with me 30 years ago. Um, it can work. And I think that a lot of it was based on, you know, companies like B&B Italia, Minotti, they offer this service of recovering, which is actually Velcro-based. So it's easy to lift off a cover, put a new one on. So you can give new life to a piece of furniture that you have that has been well chosen. The issue we have with those manufacturers is those covers are too expensive. They're very, very expensive to replace. Um, and there are other of the manufacturers that we well know where you can, you know, I'm sitting on one, of, you know, Noel, Mies van der Rohe, Barcelona chair, beautiful. But um, how am I going to get it recovered? Because they don't offer that service. So, you know, we need to be able to, uh, you know, you do want these companies to be able to offer the repair rather than the throwaway. Yeah. yeah I, I think we could talk about this for a long time, actually. And eco design obviously is, is high on our agenda. And really, the first question is will customers pay? I, I guess. Should customers pay? You know, if we're being truly sustainable, is there a way of designing our products with the correct raw materials, with raw materials that are completely circular that you can put back into the um, supply chain and, and ultimately not increase cost and do the right thing in terms of sustainability? So, so it, it, it's a big question. So it, it could be, and I'm not saying this is the case, it could be, if you design your products correctly, they're easy to disassemble. You could service them, for instance, like a chair, like a high-end chair, like a mattress, and you're recycling raw materials that are circular. Maybe then the customer doesn't have to pay. Maybe it's a different model for selling that product as well. You know, that that comes into it too, I think. In, in terms of um, how we sort of communicate and that clear message, I I, I'm not a marketeer, so I, I struggle to answer that, to be perfectly honest. But we do need a clear message. I think it needs to be an end-to-end -end message. Um, obviously, products do need the, – the best thing about a, re a recyclable product is actually design it. And Daniel's right. To be extremely robust and to last, um, you need an end-to-end -end -to -end story that's well communicated. Um, but beds are slightly different in that, you know, people will change them after, say, 10 years because of hygiene issues, potentially. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest a chair is a little bit different to a bed. So our industry, there is going to be some, obviously, you're not going to get, well, you could get a bed that would last for 50 years because the spring systems will not give in. But then do you really want to sleep on a bed that's 50 years old? I don't know. You know, there's there's other ways of solving that, obviously, but um you know, eco design is very, very important. And potentially, I think there is a way of getting fully circular raw materials back into the supply chain will ultimately mean maybe customers don't have to pay. So, Richard, can I just ask you then, you know, for example, with a mattress, you know, yes. you know I go into someone's house and they say, we want the whole thing redone, get rid of everything. Yeah. Um, where do I start? Do I ring... So I look at the mattress, it's a Harrison Spinks. Would I ring you and say, can I send that back to you? I mean, you know, obviously there's the transport cost issues as well. Um, yes. Getting it back, you know, it's going to cost yeah. me more money to send it all the way up to Yorkshire um, as it is that, that, that it's going to be that you can recycle it and resell it. it. You know, when does this start just being a sort of folly um, and that we could make it into reality? That's a very good question, and I wasn't prepared prepared for really difficult questions, Daniel. So, <laughs> well, uh, well um, I guess you all know we've um, we've set up a recycling plant. Now, obviously, all the current no, we oh, sorry, have. <laughs> we have yeah. So, so we do now recycle some of our mattresses, not all of them. So, we've made a start. So. We any returns that come back to Leeds now, we will disassemble, recycle. Um, some of that recycled material does go back into the supply chain. Realistically, we need um, relationships with our retailers and uh, come up with a mechanism for return. Because one of the issues with recycling is how the hell do you get them back? They're big, bulky okay. items. 
Mm. And, you know, all you're doing then is a, a scrap item that, that potentially has quite a lot of value, actually. If you look at the raw materials in our mattresses, natural fillings are actually very easy to recycle and they'll come back as good as new. Polyester is easy to recycle once you've invested in some kit to do it. Steel mm. obviously is an all time high now, but you have to have intelligent ways of recycling that and getting it out of the product. So you need to be innovative in the way you disassemble as well. All that is achievable, not a problem. The big issue we've got as an industry is how do you get it back to the recycling centre? Because all you're doing is putting fuel transport into it, which is CO2. Mm. That's a really difficult question to answer. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know I've got an answer at the moment. I think, I think you know, come the revolution, um, um, and interior designers and furniture designers take over the country, um, the... Um, 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 and uh, we had loads of money. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had outside of big cities just a, a huge warehouse where you know you, you're emptying your house, you send it up there, somebody filters it through and either breaks it down into components, sends it back to the manufacturers, um, or actually resells. Um, and they have a center for um, French polishers, for upholsterers. The manufacturers offered the templates to real polster just to make it quicker and easier so you're not having to reinvent the wheel every single time. Yeah. Um, um, and, and that initiative was set up by these large retailers um, uh, so that they, you know, it's not having to be focused on individual manufacturers uh, because I think you know, the discussions we had, it's impossible to do that and make a profit. In fact, you'd make a loss. I think collaboration is the way forward, um, both in the, obviously it's slightly different in the retail sector, but I think the same principles apply in the commercial sector too, and it can only work through collaboration. But mm -hmm. going back to the education piece, I think people need to understand, I think a lot of people wouldn't realise how harmful to the environment furniture can be, and mm -hmm. particularly the raw material side of things. You know, people are talking about zero to landfill. Well, what they actually mean is it's going to incineration mm. uh, because landfill is now so expensive. And then obviously the emissions from the incineration are severely harmful. And I don't think your average, even in the commercial sector, I don't think people appreciate that. And they think, oh, well, it's generating energy from waste. Yeah, but you're still emitting harmful particulates into the environment. Mm -hmm. And so education has to be part of this. And I agree about preachy, but maybe it has to be a bit preachy. People have to understand that furniture does have a big impact. Uh, I, I think there's some interesting ideas here. Um, Sophology, one of the DFS group brands, is actually trying something new. or doing a rental model where the frame is built out of metal. Um, um, and is rented to a customer for a set period. And then using our reverse logistics network, we take it back, strip it down into component parts, recycle all of those parts, then reupholster the same frame sent out to a new customer. Brilliant. Now, it's only been running for a few months, but I can't actually attest to whether or not customers are buying into it. But I think it's really important as an industry, we explore new ways of approaching ownership of models, how people uh, use furniture throughout their lifetime. So I, I fully appreciate it would be wonderful if everyone invested in these incredible pieces with 30-year lifespans, but people's lives change so much. They need different pieces at different points in their lives. So choosing when's the right time to invest in those pieces versus using a rental model, recognising that they're in a place for a set period. It might be that they're renting their property or they know they're going to decorate a bit further down the line when they've got more capital available. Um, providing different options and solutions rather than letting them choose something that's a short-term investment that they then go to throw away. It's trying to move it. You know, IKEA gets blamed a lot for this, so I don't think that's necessarily the root cause that... They're the uh, primary pieces that people start out with when they're setting up a home before they move up in the scale and move to the more expensive pieces. Um, I think as an industry, there's also a lack of recognition that people see sustainability as a short-term problem. So if you think about the attitude there is towards food packaging and plastics and waste in that industry, everyone's very cognizant of it and makes a great deal of effort. Whereas what we're producing, they see as a long-term investment. So they don't necessarily recognise the environmental impact because of the lengthier timescales. So 
I do think there's something about having the discussions at the point of purchase to say, well, have you thought about what you're going to do with getting rid of the old pieces and helping them find solutions? So we have actually got a, a sofa rescue program where we offer to pick up the customer's old sofas right before we deliver their new one. Uh, it is a paid for service. We ask the customers to contribute a cost. It's a cost neutral to us. Um, but we're looking to expand that and try and do that reupholstery service where we try and salvage those pieces that actually still have value. The biggest challenge we have is trying to find the skilled labour to really take those pieces apart and salvage them. And it is so hard. It is so much easier to just strip them down into component materials and recycle them individually rather than salvage something that's been existing. And one of the biggest problems we're finding is the UK FR regulations Customers have this huge habit of cutting off the damn labels, which means the product is useless to us. We cannot do anything with it. Um, so there's, there's some absolutely basic fundamentals that if we could shift as an industry and make sure that customers are aware that those labels have to stay on the product, if we can find a way to invest more in skilled labor in this industry, we potentially could actually make some really big shifts in the right direction and really, really utilize the old pieces that are available to us. Um, but customer education is absolutely key. I think this is going to be a recurring theme here mm. within this discussion, mm. that it comes down to what we um, what we explain and educate as part of the purchasing journey, as part of the decision making, so it becomes a shared problem. Sorry, I've just now got a fire alarm going off in the background, so I'm going to put myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kate, I'll just I'll just just say how brilliant. Um, that you're doing that. It's wonderful. I mean, the idea that you can actually rent the sofa as well, as you say, young people, um, it, their lives change within five years so quickly um, and they're moving so quickly. And we now have a rental generation. Um, they're having to rent their homes. Uh, they're not buying their homes. So they mo they'll probably move quite quickly. But also, I think there's a rental mentality that now move, is, is, what is going on with this generation. Um, they're, um, they're, you know, they're used to things like Spotify. They don't actually own things. They'll rent something. They'll rent a car. They don't need to own a car. Um, so I think this approach will work very well. In fact, I've, I've, I've actually had a couple of clients who know that they're not going to stay in a home for very long, and they've done that. They have rented because some of the um, larger companies, I think people like, um, is it Made or um, some of the other numbers, they, they're actually off, offering a, a rental service. Um, it's quite expensive um, um, to do. Um, and there must be a good reason for that. But it does mean that actually in reality, in the long term, you're, you're recycling this furniture and you're reusing it rather than it just being thrown away, um, which is happening too often, I think. And the commercial of that. Sorry, Kate, you can carry on. No, I was just going to say the commercials of this are very, very tricky because it's not reached at that tipping point of scale. You need scale to make things usually work uh, cost efficiently. Um, but hopefully it's just because we're at the beginning stages. And as we you know, move and generation attitudes change and more people embrace perhaps more of a subscription model, we might be able to get to that point that it is far more cost effective. Well, it's nothing new, isn't it? I mean, my, you know, my no, parents no. lived in a higher purchase <laughs> world, you know, where, and, uh, you know, and you had to go to the bank to apply for a loan in order to buy a sofa. So, you know, we're, 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 we're stepping backwards slightly to, to go forward. I think, you know, in the last 20 years, um, I mean, it's been wonderful what's been happening with the high street um, because we are seeing so much affordable, beautifully, beautifully designed furniture come out. I, I did stride, stride by DFS recently and thought, wow, DFS is actually doing some really covetable pieces of furniture here. There's some really <laughs> sexy, sellable furniture. Um, but, you know, I, I, the problem it, with it of quite often is it's too cheap. Um, mm. It's too disposable. It, it's, I'm not saying DFS is cheap. My deepest apologies, Kate. But there's, there's um, <laughs> um, you, know, the, the, you know, it's been great as a designer because it's been much easier for me to furnish people's homes. But at the same time, people maybe aren't valuing that furniture so much and just turning it over just a little bit too quickly. So going back to the older generation where, you know, furniture was reused is, 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 is something that actually is quite massively attractive, although I don't think people might complain a little bit at the beginning. 
in the commercial sector, it is starting to happen in terms of furniture as a service, but it's very, very early days. But, you know, I would ask the question, why do you need to own your furniture? And that manufacturers and suppliers need to collaborate in order to come up with affordable solutions that mean that companies don't. But then equally, fiscal policy needs to change. At the moment, the government is offering incentives for people, for companies to buy furniture, um, whereas they don't get those benefits from renting. And so therefore, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize they're going to buy. And I'm quite sure, given that I'm sitting here as the furniture makers company, I'll probably get shot down in flames. But, you know, all of these, you know, there are various models that need to be considered to encourage greater value retention in the raw materials that are in those products. Yeah, it's a good point. Very good point. So I'm just uh, just conscious of time because we uh, it's a very fascinating discussion, but there's one area that we uh, decided we were going to look at as well today, and that is the idea of circularity. So is it commercially viable? So what we're talking about here is maybe looking at the retail sector, as an example, leading the race on circularity through <coughs> productions from retailers with the furniture as a service that we've just been talking about. But are the schemes, including take back options that you're seeing, do you feel they're commercially viable? Um, will they be widely accepted? And how do you how would you see maybe the, uh, you know, this actually working in practice? And I, I'll just make it, I'm picking up on one of Kate's earlier points. This really is about volume as well. So if we look at it, circularity has to be commercially viable going forward. Otherwise, what do we do? If it's not, none of us are going to win. So it has to be. But you do need the volumes. For instance, if we're going to recycle and reuse lots of these very valuable raw materials, and for us, they are very valuable, um, it has to be commercially viable. We have to be innovative and make it commercially viable. Otherwise, what do we do? Hmm. But doesn't it come down to collaboration again? It comes back to this reverse logistics um, discussion. Oh, it does. And unfortunately, certainly in the commercial field, we have been driven over recent years by sort of driving down costs by just-in-time manufacturing. And so manufacturers have very little warehousing space. Everything is delivered at the point of manufacture and it's out the door. So to actually introduce um, triage of goods coming back in order to introduce them back into the supply chain or into the manufacturing process, I should say, is extremely difficult and requires huge investment. And so therefore, the only real way forward is collaboration between everyone or you know key players within the industry so that we can set up something that allows circularity to become real. Which is kind of really going back to a point that maybe, Daniel, you made earlier. You know, you were talking about sort of the big centre with the furniture polishers and, the, you know, just take that concept for a minute, but think about if you had companies that were certified that could be partners to manufacturers to help them in this process because it is a huge ask isn't it for a manufacturer to completely change the way they're operating right now i think that is the way forward i think the difficulty is commercial viability isn't it mm. how is it funded um is it some sort of you know cooperative um, which for most commercial companies probably doesn't sit comfortably with them because we're in business to make money and so therefore, how does that work? But somehow we've got to break that down in order to make, because I do think having centres is probably the way forward um, and perhaps it's co-funded, but it is a difficult, um, and, it, and there is a huge potential to create new green jobs, but at the moment, we have problem recruiting people anyway. So, um, you know, there's a big training issue here as well. But, uh, you know, maybe um, the large manufacturers have got to, or, or might find that they will follow what what is actually happening happening as a culture um, uh, with with people um, today. Individuals they do do that. They they um, um, you know apart from that the old stories of seeing mattresses dumped on the corners in the countryside and everywhere else that we see a lot of because there, there's nothing that you can do with them. So people are exasperated with them. But actually, you know, if um, occasionally when um, you know, I've done my office up and I'm, I've got a couple of chairs and we say, oh, what we're going to do with them? Well, actually, I sit them on the roadside and say, 
watch how long they will last. And we li- literally put them at the front door of the of the building, and within half an hour, someone's picked them up and they've found use of it. People, um, we're seeing the wonderful revolution of eBay. Um, that must have been fantastic for, for um, cyclical use of furniture. Um, I'd love to use it more um, uh, with my own clients, but you know they're very reluctant to have people coming into their homes to pick furniture up. Um, and you know, I've I've had some wonderful pieces of furniture which I'm looking at, thinking, what am I going to do with it? Um, the client, you know, these are wealthy clients; they don't want this anymore. They're bored with it; they want to move on. But at the same time, I can't sell it on eBay um, because uh, they don't want someone walking into their homes. So, you know, to have those central um, units where I could send a piece up um, and someone there judges it as something that can be actually resold or reupholstered or just broken it down to its components does feel like it's the way ahead, doesn't it? Well, the problem with office furniture, I mean, it's interesting you say you could put it out on the pavement and it goes. Um there is obviously a big. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you live, but there you go. Um, <laughs> um, but in the office furniture industry, there is a big sector of the market that handles obviously um, disposals. But the problem is, is that most office furniture, not the high end brands, but most of the sort of mainstream products, have very little resale value. And so, therefore, if you try and warehouse to keep it, to enable it to be resold, the warehousing space is probably going to be more valuable than the furniture itself. Mm. And so what happens? Yeah, it goes to landfill or is burnt. Um, It's changing, but that's fundamentally what happens. Mm. I think it'll be very interesting to see if the end producer responsibility legislation uh, does come into effect for the furniture industry, because that will force through the innovation that's needed. Um, I would also stress that we do have a long tail effect on this. So although we could design products now for future that are very circular, we we still have a legacy of what 60, 70 years worth of furniture, which was made in a very different way. Mm. And I go back to things like the FR treatment that's been applied to um, all of our upholstery items means it's incredibly difficult to recycle those that chemical mix just prevents any of the textiles from being recycled the use of uh, foam has meant that most products are contaminated and incredibly difficult to recycle so we've got to find um, some very innovative solutions uh, to these problems we are working with a couple of universities on material mixes to try and find different ways of using the materials but it's going to, just going to take time and probably quite a bit of investment and ultimately partnership. I do think partnership is going to be absolutely key in this industry to making it work. Um, so, yes, I would stress everybody on this call that if you have ideas or you're looking to collaborate, please reach out because we're, it's not going to happen uh, fast enough, I think, for all of us if we try and operate individually. Um, that might be counterintuitive to some of the CFO's uh, agendas and some of the targets we've all been set, but uh, it is really, really important. Kate, I couldn't agree with you more. And I don't think it is counterintuitive long term, short term, maybe, um, <laughs> because I think there is a value to making true investment in greater sustainability. And I think ultimately companies will be rewarded for those that um lead the way, such as yourselves and others on this call today, um, because that is our future. We cannot keep doing what we have been doing. Mm. There are some parts of the world that are thinking about introducing raw material tax. So it will start becoming prohibitive to actually use raw materials to produce product. You'll be forced to use recycled materials. Um, So, yeah, I think legislation will drive quite a lot of this agenda, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. It forces everybody to change their game. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of COP26 in the next few weeks. I agree. I mean, whilst none of us like taxation, well, maybe some do. <laughs> um, <laughs> generally speaking, corporates don't like taxation, but I think in this occasion, there has to be measures to enable and to fund indeed this greater yeah. drive towards. Um, sustainability. I mean, if you look in France, they have used the EPR scheme to fund reuse and recycling. And 
I think to allow um, simply companies to do their own thing and expect them to do the right thing, I think probably they'll have to be both carrot and stick. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that was uh, that was a fascinating uh, discussion. Time is marched on really quickly this morning, and uh, I just want to thank you all for for your contributions and taking the time out to to be with us this morning. Uh, it's been a very a very valuable valuable session. So, just really looking maybe at a couple of the, the sort of key takeaways. The the first one on on that subject we looked at was the need for sort of this key uh, strong leadership required to make uh, clear sustainability standards. Uh, ones that that educate. Uh, consumers was something that seemed to come across really strongly in, in the discussion. The second one, uh, we looked, you know, we looked at design focus. That, you know, looking from the concepts stage to incorporate materials and services that would enable longevity, and that idea of sort of buying better first if possible, um, and and also really interesting. I think um, that point that that you brought out, Kate, about giving options. Giving options to the consumer, where they're, they're, it's not just a, a buy or don't buy decision, but there's rental options, there's other ways in which you can can affect the ownership. I thought that was really fascinating. And the last, the last one on circularity, the, the the message that seemed to come out very clearly was this uniting of people and companies in partnership to be able to get some uh, forward movement on this and make it commercially viable and and therefore achievable for everybody. So, uh, so thank you, Richard, Kate, Daniel, and Joe, for sharing all of your experiences. Um, I know there's a few questions, so uh, we will uh, put those to you post event. Um, and if you can have a, a look at those, and we can respond to to the audience. Um, we will also uh, publish and distribute a summary of uh, of the key uh, points that came from today's uh, session, as well. And then there's just one thing I'd like to, in closing, mention to you. Uh, the livery will have a climate action group launch event on Monday, the 18th of October at 5 p.m. Um, so you you will receive some details on this shortly, um, but it, it looks like an extremely worthwhile event for you to attend and learn more about this, especially aligned with um, COP26 coming up in Glasgow shortly. So uh, thank you very much for, for attending our, our session this morning. I hope you found it interesting and uh insightful as I have. And uh, thank you again to our panel. Thank you. Thanks. No, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye Bye. Now.